Hello, it's Eric from Stanford University and Strong Medicine. Today I'm going to be talking about the diversity of sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Before I get into the specifics, this video comes with a few caveats. First, the topics of sex, gender, and sexual orientation are highly politicized here in the US. If you've arrived at this video wanting to learn more about the relevant politics or activism, I'm afraid that's not what I'll be covering. Instead, I'll be discussing concepts and terminology from the perspective of a healthcare professional. Which brings me to caveat number two. Whenever we define terms, we risk those terms turning into labels, and we also risk reducing the unique characteristics and life experiences of an individual into stereotypes and collections of assumptions. We need to keep in mind that there is as much diversity among gay people as there is among straight people, and as much diversity among transgender people as cisgender people. A person's sex, gender, and orientation may be parts of their identity, but they are certainly not the only parts. Caveat number three, Terminology evolves over time. Some of the terms I'll discuss today were not in common use 10 years ago and might not be in common use 10 years from now. And some which once may have seemed innocuous may now be seen as offensive. For example, homosexual, hermaphrodite, and sexual preference are all terms that were once common and which now should be avoided. And the last caveat is that no matter what you learn from me today, always try to understand and mirror the terms an individual uses for themselves. So for example, if a person refers to themselves as gender fluid or bisexual, do not say, you know, I don't think you really are that thing. Instead, you can, in a very non-judgmental way, say something like, what does bisexual mean to you? Or, I ha haven't met someone before who is gender fluid, do you feel comfortable telling me more about it? If you're talking to the other person, not as a friend, but rather in a clinical context, for example, if they are a patient and you are a healthcare professional, be sure to distinguish the information that's needed for clinical care from any information that's just idle curiosity, as the latter may be seen as intrusive and unwelcome. Also, some people don't like to place any labels at all on their sex, gender, and orientation. That's okay and should be respected. All right. So now with all of that out of the way, let's talk terminology. The first thing to know is that sex, gender, and sexual orientation are not the same thing. Yes, they are related, but they are also separate domains of a person's identity and experience. And within each domain are different characteristics, none of which are dichotomous or binary. So sex is not just male or female, gender is not just man or woman, and sexual orientation is not just gay or straight. Let's tackle each domain one at a time. First up, sex. This is sometimes labeled biological sex, but I think that's misleading since it implies that gender and orientation are somehow less biological. Sex describes one's physical self at birth. To many people, it refers to whether a person is male or female. That might seem very elementary. After all, sex is simply determined by what's between your legs, right? But remember that I said each domain contains multiple separate characteristics and that none of them are binary. So how is that possible with sex? Aren't babies born with either a penis or a vagina and thus are either boys or girls? Well, no, not necessarily. You see, sex is determined by a combination of external genitalia, internal reproductive organs, and the sex chromosomes. These don't always match according to common experience. For example, infants can be born with what is known as ambiguous genitalia, in which they don't clearly have just a typical penis or clearly have a typical clitoris and vagina, but instead they have something else. This may be an unusually small penis with a urethral opening in the scrotum, it may be un an unusually large clitoris that resembles a penis. An infant may have a vagina, but also palpable testicles within the labial folds. There are countless variations. 
Sometimes an infant may have external genitalia that appears clearly male or clearly female, but with internal reproductive organs that don't match with what might be typically expected. For example, in a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome, a mutation in the androgen receptor renders a fetus incapable of responding to testosterone while developing in utero. As a consequence, the fetus develops a vagina and clitoris, but they have no uterus or fallopian tubes, and instead of ovaries, they have non-functioning testes that reside somewhere within the pelvis. Our chromosomes add yet another layer of complexity. You probably learned in high school biology that human cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of which are the so-called sex chromosomes because they determine our sex. If an embryo inherits one X chromosome from each parent, they will typically develop into a female. If, on the other hand, an embryo inherits an X chromosome from their mother and a Y chromosome from their father, they will typically develop into a male. But sometimes, genetic conditions affecting hormones can lead to discordance between chromosomes and a person's physical appearance. A person's cells could be XX, yet the person is anatomically male, while another person's cells could be XY, yet they are anatomically female. A variation of this phenomenon is called mosaicism. Mosaicism is a condition in which the cells in an individual's body don't all carry the same DNA. So when a person has mosaicism affecting the sex chromosomes, some of their cells might carry one X and one Y chromosome, while their other cells might carry two X chromosomes or just one X chromosome. Such individuals can have a very wide diversity of external appearances and internal anatomy. And in fact, some of you watching this video could have either mosaicism of your sex chromosomes or have a discordance between your chromosomes and your external appearance, and you might not even know about it. So the bottom line with sex is that it's way more complicated than just male or female. The term intersex is commonly used to describe people whose combination of genitalia, internal anatomy, and sex chromosomes don't fit into the typical male versus female dichotomy. An alternative term for this, disorders of sex development, was introduced into the medical lexicon about 10 years ago, but has proven controversial. Many intersex individuals don't see themselves as having, as having a disorder per se, and activists also fear that the term might sway parents of an intersex infant towards making an unnecessary and irreversible medical decision for their child, such as drastic surgical alteration of their genitalia. The next broad domain is gender. Gender can be seen as having two main characteristics. First is gender identity. This is a person's inherent sense of being a man or a woman, or both, neither, somewhere in the middle, or another gender altogether. Gender identity is internal and is not visible to others. Cisgender describes a person whose gender identity is the same as the sex assigned to them at birth, Transgender describes a person whose gender identity differs from the sex assigned to them at birth. A transgender man is a person whose assigned sex at birth was female, but who identifies now as a man. A transgender woman is a person whose assigned sex at birth was male, but who identifies now as a woman. Gender queer describes a person whose gender identity does not conform to the traditional binary gender paradigm, Non-binary is sometimes used as a synonym for this. And gender fluid describes a person whose gender identity is not fixed, but varies with time or varies based on situation. Transgender individuals often adopt names that are different from their birth or legal names, and may prefer pronouns that are consistent with their gender identity and not with their assigned sex. In other words, it is gender, not sex, that usually determines what pronouns to use for a person. And since gender identity is an internal sense of the individual, it is literally impossible to know for certain what pronouns are most appropriate without asking. Sometimes these pronouns may be words unfamiliar to you, such as Z or Zir, as the individual may want to convey that they have a non-binary gender identity. Some genderqueer individuals prefer the singular they. But the bottom line is to always use the individual's preferred name and pronouns 
and to make these clear in the person's medical chart. Continuing to use a transgender individual's original name and original pronouns against their request is offensive and can be traumatizing. In addition to gender identity, there is also gender expression. Gender expression is the gender which an individual chooses to present themselves as to the world. It consists of the choice of clothing, hairstyle, and makeup. It may consist of deliberate mannerisms and speech and behavior. And it may or may not be consistent with one's gender identity. When a transgender individual chooses for their physical appearance to consistently match their gender identity, this can be referred to as an affirmation of their gender identity. The transition process in which a transgender individual affirms their identity can involve changes in dress and hair, hormone therapy, and or surgery. In the past, it was common to call such surgery gender reassignment surgery. However, it's now preferable to call it gender affirming surgery or gender con confirmation surgery. Since these individuals are not actually changing genders, they are simply altering their external anatomy to match the gender that they've always been. The last broad domain is sexual orientation. One characteristic within sexual orientation is sexual attraction. If a man is sexually attracted to a woman, or a woman is sexually attracted to a man, they are heterosexual, and colloquially known as straight. A man who is sexually attracted to another man, or a woman attracted to a woman, can be considered homosexual, although gay and lesbian, respectively, are currently the generally preferred terms in the US. If a person is sexually attracted to both men and women, they are bisexual. If they are sexually attracted to all sexes and genders across both spectrums of sex and gender, that is referred to as pansexual. And if they don't feel much sexual attraction to anyone, they are asexual. One point of frequent confusion concerns the sexuality of transgender and gender non-binary individuals. Just as cisgender individuals, they can be straight, gay, bisexual, pansexual, or asexual. A person's gender is separate from their sexual orientation, and one cannot be inferred from the other. And consider for a moment a transgender woman, that is, a person who was assigned male at birth, but who now identifies as a woman. If she is attracted to men, she is heterosexual, not gay. The same is true of transgender men who are attracted to women. Another characteristic within sexual orientation is sexual behavior. Sexual behavior refers to the people with whom an individual actually has sexual relationships. While sexual attraction and behavior are usually the same, they don't need to be. For example, a person might be attracted to people of multiple sexes, yet be sexually active with only members of one sex due to societal or religious pressures. Another example might be a Catholic nun who could be straight or gay based on sexual attraction, while her sexual behavior is celibate because she is not acting on that attraction. A third characteristic is romantic attraction. Romantic attraction acknowledges that intimate relationships don't require sexual activity. A person can be sexually attracted to multiple genders, but only romantically interested in one, or vice versa. Or someone might experience only romantic attraction without any sexual attraction at all to any sex or gender, or vice versa. And the final characteristic within sexual orientation is sexual identity, which refers to whether an individual sees themselves as straight versus gay versus something different. One final term to mention, which somewhat transcends the individual domains, is queer. Queer is an umbrella term that individuals may use to describe either a gender and or a sexual orientation that does not conform to the cisgender heterosexual societal norms. When I was growing up, queer was a uniformly pejorative term. However, the word has since been reclaimed by the younger generations as a source of pride, but not universally so. Just remember to always mirror the terms an individual uses for themselves, but also keep in mind that there may be a generational gap regarding how the word queer is perceived. So let's sum up. Sex, gender, and sexual orientation 
are related but distinct concepts. Sex refers to whether a person is male, female, or intersex, which means they don't quite fall into either category. Sex is dependent upon external genitalia, internal reproductive organs, and the sex chromosomes. Gender refers to whether a person is a man or woman, or a category which falls outside the two-gender dichotomy, which might be referred to as genderqueer or non-binary. Individuals whose gender matches their sex assigned at birth are referred to as cisgender, while those whose gender does not match their assigned sex are referred to as transgender. Gender includes the concepts of gender identity, which is one's inter inherent internal sense of being a man, woman, or something different, as well as gender expression, which refers to how an individual presents themselves to those around them. Sexual orientation refers to whether a person is straight, gay, or lesbian, bisexual, meaning attracted to both men and women, pansexual, meaning attracted to people across the entire non-binary spectrum of sex and or gender, or asexual, meaning little specific attraction at all. Sexual orientation includes the concepts of sexual attraction, sexual behavior, romantic attraction, and sexual identity. I'm going to conclude with one final point that comes back to the caveat about labels. It's true that terms allow us to categorize people. For example, I could say that I'm a cisgender heterosexual male. But each of these terms exists on a continuous spectrum. So there's not just 20 or 30 different combinations of sex, gender, and orientation, but rather as many combinations as there are people. Every individual is unique with a combination of thoughts, emotions, and experiences that are unlike anyone else's. These terms exist as a quick shorthand, but a true understanding of another person requires going beyond the labels, casting aside assumptions, and just getting to know them better by listening to their story. I'd like to thank members from Stanford's LGBTQ Meds student group, as well as Stanford Queer Student Resources for providing feedback about the script. This video is just an introduction to a very rich and complex topic. If you would like to learn more about LGBTQ health, I recommend a Coursera course, Health Across the Gender Spectrum, taught by my Stanford colleague, Maya Adam, and also the very comprehensive website for the National LGBT Health Education Center, which is a program of the renowned Fenway Institute.